Do you ever remember being lost from your parents? Where you were out with them and next thing you know, they're not there. Has that ever happened? Anybody willing to share their event? Not to me personally, but to my younger brother it happened to. We were at the Appalachian Fair and my brother that was a year younger than me and myself, we could fit through this one area that my youngest brother couldn't. We asked him to go around to be on the other side. And then when I got around the other side, he wasn't there. And, and I was looking everywhere for him and I could tell he was but I saw him, I finally saw him, and he was going off in the opposite direction of where we had told him to go. And I managed to chase him down and, and get with him. And I remember, you know, being the oldest brother, it was my responsibility to watch out for him. Mm -hmm. and even though he was only out of my care for, you know, less than two minutes, it was still a very, very humbling thing for me, that responsibility I took on in the day. It was scary for you, and you could tell he was very... Brady, do you want to share yours? You raise your hand. You remember being lost. You wander off. <laughs> well, this is, I was really young when this happened, but um, I was probably, I don't know, oh, maybe seven, eight years old. I don't know. But anyway, my, my, uh, the uh, family got together and we went to the, to the uh, circus game, the town of circus. Or the, Fair carnivals and circuses, man. You know, a whole, a whole thing there. And um, anyway, so uh, we were going up through the ground and looking at different animals. You know, they were flying. And um, I was following my uncle. And um, he was, uh, the next thing I was just kind of got enthralled with all the animals and different animals and stuff. And I got, uh, I came to this. Big gorilla. I forgot what his name was. Mighty Joe Young, I think they call him or something. Back in that, I mean, this is. Oh, it was the 80s. Yeah, in the Stone Age. And uh, he, uh, you know, I remember I saw this gorilla, you know, and I was just enthralled with him, you know. And I, I stopped, you know, and I looked around, and in, in a minute I was, I looked around, and I knew, and then I panicked, you know, and I took off looking, you know, and of course I was probably going further away and didn't, but anyway, so but, uh, The gorilla didn't take you in as its own? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Might have been an option. I, uh, I don't remember how old I was. Um, I could not tell you. All I remember is that we were in a parking structure. So I don't know what my family was doing, if, what, where we were going or anything like that. I just remember families there. It feels like you look away for a second and then they're not. And the only thing I really remember is standing next to one of the support poles and just crying. There was nobody around, so no one could come up and go, well, what's wrong? Why don't you don't help me out. I just stood next to the pole and I was crying and I don't even know how long I was there. I mean, it could have been a short period of time. I mean, it, in, in that situation, every second seems ridiculously long. And, but I do remember the relief when I saw my mom walk around the corner and recognize, all right, I've, I've been found. But I remember the terror and how afraid I was and oh my goodness, it was, it was nerve wracking. But I blocked out some of the information, but I only remember the, the important stuff. I was lost and I was found. <laughs> Uh, well, today uh, we're going to be looking at Joseph, and before we get into the passage at hand, I want us to begin to paint a picture of who Joseph was. So we've got just three verses today. One of them, we're, I think, well, I'm not a strong reader yet, I read, so um, one verse is, is pretty long, but we've got three passages. <clears throat> who would like to uh, read those? Jerry, we've got Matthew. Uh, what about Matthew 2, 13 through 15? Thank you, Don. And then the big one, Luke 2. Thank you, Charlie. All right, so the first passage we're going to be looking at is Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 21. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. 
His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce, divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So we meet Joseph, and he's engaged to Mary. And I'm sure he's told by her that she's pregnant. She tells him what's going on and, and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> but he doesn't really believe her. I mean, who can blame her? This hasn't happened before. And so he's going to put her away quietly, doesn't want to cause her any shame, doesn't want it to be public. And then God shows up and tells him what's going on. And we see Joseph, without, without any hesitation, changes his mind. He's not going to divorce her. He's going to continue on with the marriage, and he's going to obey the command that the Lord has given him. Another interesting verse comes to mind, and it comes in the next chapter. Um, it's interesting because when God reveals his plan first of Jesus, he goes to Mary first, then to Joseph. And in this next chapter, we find that What's going on is Herod hears that there's this new king of the Jews, and so he wants to find this kid, obviously, to, to destroy the child. But um, it's interesting what, appear, what, how, what, what plays out when God appears to Joseph. So Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now, for some people this might not be that important of a verse, but <clears throat> God doesn't appear to Mary. He has appeared to her, it's like he's afraid to appear to her, yet... Now, when it concerns the life of Mary and the child, what does he do? He comes to Joseph. Well, why is that? Well, Joseph is the head. He has responsibility to both Mary and to Jesus. And so he comes to Joseph only. And what does he ask Joseph to do? Pack up and get out. And what does Joseph do? Exactly that. He does it. So what God is asking him to do isn't small. It's you're relocating. And you're, you're leaving now. And so what he's calling him to do is significant. And we see Joseph responding. Now, one of the things that I find interesting as we, we look at the story of Joseph is we see this man who is honorable. We see this man who, who loves at the, at the time, loves this woman who he thought had betrayed him. And then when God shows up, he, all right, God, I trust you, I believe you, and I'm going to follow through. Then God shows up in a vision. All right, God, I trust you, I believe you, I'm going to follow through. But we all make mistakes. And so we talked about getting lost as a child. Maybe you have lost your child at some point. Okay? Now I'm not going to make you share your stories. But when uh, Heather and I, uh, we were at the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, we had her sister in town. And so at the time, we had three small children. And so one of the kids, Maverick, um, he had a great old time. And when you leave, you walk into this arcade. So it was like, all right, let's, let's play, let's play games. And so we're trying to find something for all the kids, you know, something that stimulates them and whatnot. And for some reason... Maverick looked around and, and said, I didn't see anybody, which is weird because we were all around. We weren't hiding from him. Uh, but you couldn't go back into the museum, so what does he do? He wanders out on the main strip of Gatlinburg, and he is immediately lost. I will give him credit, though. Uh, the only place he kind of knew where to go was to the ticket booth that he saw, because he remembered that's where we bought tickets. And so he went there. And so as we're frantically looking around trying to find him, I go out and I go to the ticket booth thinking, well, maybe 
And sure enough, there he is. And he is just terrified. Um, it was a scary moment. But that's because as an adult, I know, I know what's in this world. I know, you know the first thing that comes to mind. And so it was a very scary thing. Now, what would have happened if we had gone home an hour away and realized we don't have Maverick? Would the, would the, would the panic be more? What if, what if we were three days away and realized, oh, we don't have Maverick? Do you, you, can, you can sense the escalation of the, you know, the terror. The further away you are, the more scared you are. Well, this is what we find in Luke chapter 2, looking at verses 41 through 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem to the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went to the festival, according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their, rel their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been, search have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother, his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So in this, we, we kind of see a timeline. They're a day out. They turn back, which requires a day. And then there's two days of looking. How frantic of a look would that be for Joseph and his family? Do you think they were calm? Absolutely terrified. Um, he lost his son a couple days. And now they're return, trying to, they return. They're looking for him. Uh, but it wasn't just that he lost his son. He lost the Messiah. So I, just the I mean, it's at some point you've got to go, oh crud, I'm the worst stepdad ever. You lost, you lost the Messiah who is going to take away sins. Um, but the context of the journey, I do want us to kind of bring clarity to that, as some of you may know. So devout Jews would return to Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate the festivals. Passover is a big one. So what would usually happen is, is the whole family, both, all the family, would travel together because it's safer that way. And if you live a long way off and you're traveling, obviously they're at least more of, than a day travel away, at least. So it would have been probably maybe Joseph and his whole family, Mary and, and her whole family all traveling together in some, this kind of caravan. All right, so there's going to be a lot of people involved. There's going to be a lot of other kids and... This is kind of the context we're finding. So I do want to kind of give them credit because it's not like me and Heather left and, oh my goodness, we forgot Evelyn. We've got two kids and we only remembered one. It's not like that. Well, and I think you need to remember too, he was 12 years old. That's like, in this time period, one year from being a man, practically. You know, um, different. 12-year-olds aren't the same. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's, it's true. that's true. It's a Twelve, twelve year olds are way different now. Yeah, so, well, yes, <laughs> it's a hard labor. Yeah, you know, well, yes, they would still be keeping an eye on him. It wouldn't be unusual for probably a twelve year old that time to be fairly independent and allowed to mingle among the rest of the family. I mean, if any of us were, were with all of our family, we happen to be traveling, and, and you could walk, and you could walk between and see your cousins on. I mean, no. No, walk next to me. No, I mean, no, none of us would do that. Yeah, go interact, mingle, all that fun stuff. I, I want to know, though, what he was asking them in that dialogue. I mean, Luke, why didn't you tell us? Give us more information there. Yeah. You know? Luke, Luke we, something, something one of my professors told me, which, which helps me a lot in times like these, is the Bible tells you what you need to know, <laughs> not necessarily what you want to know. Because there's so much in this story. That I'd like to know, because <laughs> it is it is it is fascinating this story and why it's placed. We're going to get to that here in a moment, though. Um, so they're traveling in a big group. They realize 
that, you know, Jesus isn't there. A lot, I think a lot of times we can slip into complacency. Somebody's got to be watching them. Look at all these people. And when we get into that state, when we think somebody's got to be watching, we realize that really nobody's watching. And so no one really knew that Jesus wasn't there until they did know, and that was the beginning of this shock and terror. But I want to observe Jesus for a moment. What's he doing when they find him? Debating with the teachers. So he's at, he's at the temple, he's debating with them, um, he's asking questions and he's answering. Um, and I think this is important because I've found that when speaking to people, um, I think you can learn a lot more about someone by the questions that they ask than, than what they say. For example, um, I think you can, you can gauge their intellect or their, um, their reasoning as they're asking questions because if, if you're ever in a conversation with somebody, or in this case where he's in a temple and he's talking to Pharisees, which as you know throughout his whole life, he's had, he has these duels with them. Um, a well-placed question can either poke a hole in the logic of the person who's speaking. Um, it can show that the person who's speaking hasn't fully thought out what they're saying. Um, but it also shows that you are actively and engaged in the conversation. It's not just, I'm taking in and whatnot. And so I think questions weigh a lot more in a dialogue or in an in interaction. He never lost that, though. He always asked the Pharisees questions. I mean, he never lost that ability to make them think. And he always, as an adult, I mean. And, I, and, and so I think questions are important when we're talking about an interaction because um, I had a good friend in Indiana that randomly we would go on trips to Louisville, which was about an hour away. Um, so that'd be a two-hour drive minimum. And we loved that drive because... It was just, we would dialogue and talk, but we would kind of be devil's advocate for one another and, and try and make sure what we're discussing, we, we fully thought out and landed on proper ground. And so we talk about the Bible and theology and, and really bounce things off of each other. It was really a great relationship because it helped us both to grow. And so Jesus is not just asking questions, he's also answering questions. Um, and in verse 47, it says, And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Um, one commentator kind of talked about this. Um, Jesus is 12 years old, and he's questioning and answering the Pharisees. And he said this, When we realize the impressive intellectual insight and analysis of Jewish rabbis, this is very impressive. This is something like a middle school child discussing physics with a rocket scientist. I mean, think about it. When's the last time you read the book of Romans? Have you, have you read Paul and how he lays out an argument? Is it easy to follow? No. no, because he's very, very intellectual and very deep. You've got to wrestle through Romans. But, that's, but he was a Pharisee. This is how they thought. that They were very smart. We're not going to put it past them. However, what we find is Jesus is sparring with them. But here's the question. Why would Luke record this event when all the other Gospels were more concerned about the birth and ministry of Jesus? Why would Luke, having investigated the claims of Jesus, include this story of the Messiah? Why do you think he would do that? I mean, it is a big, it was a big call of what, what your son's going to be. That's kind of, a, I mean, and, I, and to be honest, when, I don't know, I feel like when, when, when you hear that he's going to take away the sins, the last thing she thought about was the crucifixion. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think Luke, you know, from, from the inference here, Luke evidently had access to Mary when he was writing this, and I think he got a lot more detail than a lot of the other authors did because of his own relationship with Mary. I mean, he's interviewing people, because as you recall, he's writing this to Theophilus, um, and so he's investigating, interviewing, and so he had to speak to someone who would have been a part of this event, because why, why else would they have shared it? And it could very well have been Mary that he spoke to. 
Um, it says here that she had treasured this. So that means she put it in the back of her mind and she made sure to remember it to, to tell it later. However Luke got a hold of it, that, that part was at least reported that she, mm -hmm. when it happened at the time, she made a mental note to remember it. What other, what other reasons? The way it's recorded, recorded where afterwards he you know, says that Jesus had increased in wisdom and stature, it's recorded like this is like the turning point, like where everyone... You know, it's finally like, oh, this really is the, you know, the Messiah, or, you know, is that, you know? It's just like, you know. I don't know how to say it. I'm not good with English. Like John Prime's song. We're, no, I'm, I'm, I hear you. I know. Jesus, Jesus is the most important historical figure ever mm -hmm. to exist, and nobody knows where he was for 18 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, no, one, no one's going to remember my birthday. I mean, we got his wrong, too. We're probably off about two or three years. But still, that's where it's marked. Um, you, you, you're very, very close. Um, <clears throat> I think what we're finding here is not necessarily that everyone around him is recognizing it. I mean, if you recall, for instance, like his brothers, they didn't come to faith until after the <coughs> resurrection. His whole family thought he was a little, little kooky, even, even with everything going on. But I, 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 I agree with... with various scholars on this, that this is included because, as um, John MacArthur rightly states, he says this, Luke has already presented compelling testimony that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the one whom God would redeem and save his people. But in this passage, he turned from the testimony of others to the testimony of the child himself. Luke's account reveals plainly that at the age of 12, Jesus already possessed a complete understanding of his nature and mission, and he was God's son, come to do the Father's will. Therefore, Luke's inclusion of this event signifies its monumental importance. Jesus' identity as the Son of God incarnate was not something thrust upon him by Jewish messianic expectations or invented by his followers. Nor was it something he assumed for himself when he began his public ministry. It was his true identity when he had become aware of when he had become aware by the age of 12, 18 years before his public ministry began. Does that make sense? So you, what he's saying is this was put there to prove no, Jesus knew full well who he was before his ministry began. And this wasn't something that happened later. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was The Last Temptation of Christ or something like that. It was William Defoe, where that was kind of like this, he didn't want to be the Savior but realized it. And, that's, and, and so he's kind of addressing that in this. He goes, this wasn't something that he just decided, you know, he kind of took on later in life going, you're right, I will be the Messiah. Or that his followers put on him and said, no, this is the Messiah. He establishes at a young age, Jesus knew full well who he was and why he was here it wasn't something that came later. And I think that's very important. And I think it's important because of who Luke is and his purpose. He's establishing Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And with this story, it not only says that he is, but it says that Jesus knew full well. Even as a 12-year-old. Verse 49 says, And he said to them, Why is it that you are looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now, some translations say, had to be in my father's house. Um, those who translate the Bible don't necessarily agree on this. However, it doesn't change any sort of doctrine or anything like that. Uh, however, I believe that I must be about my father's business is the better translation because if we literally translate the verse, I'll try and, I'll try and write it fairly neat. I thought it was interesting that the text said that uh, he was obedient to his parents even after this. Yeah, he recognized the his you know the parental authority of his parents, which you know a lot of people ask what would it have been like to raise the Messiah. Well, apparently he was respectful, so that's nice. <laughs> but he also knew it wasn't. All right, 
So if you literally translate it, it says, did you not know that I have to be that of my father? Now what is important about the verse is that. So that is plural. And so when you're translating, it's not talking about that I'm, I'm a part, for example, uh, when Jesus talks about um, a master taking a slave into their house. Right here it says house, but because this is plural, it would be more translated as, I, wouldn't you know that I'd be, a part, be in my father's houses? Well, that doesn't make sense. There's one temple. And so translating it, it better translates, because this is plural, that I would be about my father's uh, affairs, my father's business, and so on. So it, it's not something that's agreed upon necessarily within scholars, but it's not something that they're saying this is complete and utter heresy if you go this way or that way. Um, it's tough to translate it in the Greek because if we look at it literally in English, this is what we're working with, but, these, but this is the important word, and because it's plural, it changes the direction and content of the text. Does that, I know it doesn't make entire sense, but that's why you land with, I would be about my father's business or about my father's affairs because of the plurality of this, not I would be at my father's houses. Does that kind of make sense? We know that God has many things going on, interests, so on. I can't, I, I, I got nothing. I don't know. So the, just kind of breaking down, that's, that's why people will land with, I must be about my father's business because of the plurality of the text. I'll erase it so we don't keep, con don't, don't keep confusing. But this is also interesting because if we look at Jesus, it's not uncommon that a son would take up the father's business. So what was Joseph's dad's job? Carpenter. carpenter. What did Jesus do? He was a carpenter. But I find it interesting is he didn't just concern himself with his earthly father's business, being a carpenter. But very clearly, even at a young age, he was concerned about why he was there, who he's serving, and, 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 and God the Father. He's taking on the business of both fathers. And so I find that very, very interesting because of the fact that Jesus didn't overlook his earthly family. He didn't overlook Joseph. He followed in his father's footsteps, and he was good with his hands. Um, up until he began his ministry, I'm sure he still used carpentry in his everyday life. However, when his ministry began, that's what he focused on. He transitioned from both father's affairs, I'm only focusing on God the Father's affairs. But he did, he did share in both of their businesses, which I think is really, really cool. We do get one more data point uh, where Joseph was around at least at this point in time. Yeah. We don't know much about him either. Yeah. Exactly, because we, 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 we do know that he probably passed away before Jesus was crucified. That's why Jesus handed his mother over to John, and he handed, him over, handed her over to John because John was a disciple. And even though his brothers, James and Jude, would have a responsibility to her, he entrusted her to a disciple, not to his unbelieving brothers. Um, so we have three stories of Joseph in the Bible. Uh, two out of three of them are good. That's not a bad average. I mean, Pete Rose can't even brag about that. Two out of three is not bad at all. If I had three stories in the Bible, I cannot even think that I would even go one for three. I mean, Joseph had a, a, an incredible character. And, but here's what I think we, we see with, with Joseph very clearly. When God said to do something, he did it without hesitation. From trusting, uh, trusting Mary and what was going on when, when God appeared to him to take your family and flee. I kind of wish that, you know, maybe in the story God would be like, hey, you, you left Jesus back there. It, go back. It wasn't there looking around. But it, that wasn't, that's not what happened. Um, God knew what was going on. He was carrying on his own affairs, so it's fine. He's like, I, I know where my son's at. He's, a, he's doing what I want him to do. Um, However, what we look at with Joseph is something really, really incredible. Two out of three of his stories are good. And even the third one, that could happen to anybody. 
But Jesus was too busy stumping Pharisees. And that started at 12. And they did that throughout his ministry. Like you said, ask questions. He would, he would back them into a corner. They would ask a question, and how would he respond? He would respond with another question that not only answered theirs, but also showed the flaw in their own. Hence, why asking a good question can really show the flaws of the person asking or the person you're, you're interacting with. Um, how tempting was it for him, though, at 12 to go, hey, guys, let me tell you who I really am. <laughs> you know, I mean, just... I mean, I mean, he did. I mean, that's probably why they didn't understand when he's like, my father's business. And he's like, well, well, I have a carpentry, I mean, I mean, carpentry very, business here. The, but the, the Jewish you know, leaders and the Pharisees that he was talking to at that time. You would think it would, might have come up later. Like, hey, remember that 12-year-old who stumped you? This is him. I, I have no idea. I don't know if any of the Pharisees, that would be something interesting to kind of see if 18 years later, uh, how many of the Pharisees that were there were still on the Sanhedrin or in the Sanhedrin. I think it's a search that we would not be able to really find. But I, do, I would find that interesting. Um, so Joseph, he's, he's somebody who, when God said go, he went. He didn't, he didn't hesitate. He went and trusted the Lord. Where is it that we are, that we're not trusting God? <clears throat> there, there are people who, who God has, has been putting on their heart, has been pressing upon them, has been telling them, Listen, this is this is what I'm this is what I'm calling you to do, and it could be something as simple as I've been I've been wanting you to witness to your neighbor, and it could be something big as is like Joseph, where I'm, I'm relocating you. So, where are the things that that we're finding ourselves, where where God has called us that we're we're not responding in the same way as Joseph, we're still we're still holding back, we're still maybe making an excuse why we're not talking to that person, why we're not going. And these are things we need to wrestle with. Because the truth of the matter is, Joseph did incredible things. God did not just choose Mary. He also chose Joseph. And I think he made a very good choice. I think he did an outstanding job choosing the people who would, who would raise God in flesh. So, I want to encourage you guys, as we look at Joseph, as we examine his life, I want you guys to, to, to really ask the Lord to, to, to reveal you the things that, that he's been calling you to. Or maybe there's the things that he, you already know what he's been calling you to do, but you're afraid, you're, you're fearful of it, whatever the reason may be. Um, whether you need to seek godly counsel with the elders or, or through a friend, let us help you with that. If God's calling, the last thing we want is for you to stay and allow King Herod to come along and ruin it. If that makes sense. Um, so Jesus, 12 years old, what you take from the interaction? That's, I know it's a small reporting, but what you take from what the Bible says about 12-year-old Jesus? Made 12-year-old JR look like a joke. It's important to remember this is God in the flesh we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Even as a baby, anyway, therefore. I believe. The biggest thing I want you to walk away from that is, is, is exactly what, what MacArthur eloquently said. is This is in the story to affirm that Jesus knew who he was and why he was here. It was not because somebody said it later. This story alone debunks this theory that Jesus became the Messiah later on. And I think it shows an incredible providential, divine interaction or... or, or um, working certainly in the preserving of God's word to make sure that this story is in it because of the fact that God knew full well this was going to be one of the silly arguments that come up and this alone debunks that so that's the biggest thing if you if you walk away going yeah Joseph was pretty good if you walk away going this story is is essential to the the writings of, of the gospel of Luke then then we've done good any other thoughts any questions if you have questions about the Greek, I got nothing for you. <clears throat> Anything you want to add? All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that um, 
through the through the blood of, of incredible men and women, um, your word has been preserved for us to be able to read, for us to be able to study. Um, and we're thankful, Father, that this story is in fact in your word. And we thank and we're thankful, Father, for the reason why. We're thankful, Lord, uh, for the clarity of even though we may not know much about Jesus' uh, childhood or, or who he was, um, we are thankful, Father, that we see um, this understanding of he knew full well why he was here, even from a young age. And then even from a young age, he, he was stumping the Pharisees. Uh, I know, Lord, that, that, that we are not, you know, God incarnate. But, but, Lord, I pray that as we go out, as we uh, minister to others, that, that we would not be intimidated by, um, by the doctor in front of someone's name or by the education of someone, but that we would um, be humble enough to ask questions, to gain, to gain understanding, um, that we would be able to respond and be able to present the gospel. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the example of Joseph and his uh, unwavering faith and his willingness to go whenever you call. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.